So we're going to kind of work together on this presentation and talk about alfalfa for the next 20 or 25 minutes here. So um, a couple things we really think are important at this time of the year is um, how, how, how important growing alfalfa and good quality alfalfa and high yielding alfalfa really is, certainly to our dairy industry and our, our livestock, and ruminant livestock industry in general. Uh, just a couple words of kind of a comment on, on uh, Winfield, uh, part of cropland genetics. Cropland uh, is very serious about alfalfa. We have an ex excellent breeding program as far as technology that's uh, coming to market. Uh, we have reduced lignin alfalfa that's uh, about a year to two years away from bringing to market, which is uh, really exciting technology that we're also bringing through the forage genetics uh, development team uh, with Land Lakes. And so uh, that, that's a pretty exciting development. We'll spend a lot of time and I just wanted to mention that to you that that is coming to market. So some of the other technologies that we want to talk about here really uh, quickly will be around the pretty alfalfa. We'll follow up on the previous uh, speaker's uh, uh, comments a little bit on that. Then we also want to talk about the idea of uh, high management alfalfa. How can we get more alfalfa yield out of every one of the acres that you own and operate on your farms? If we look at the value of land and we look at the cost of machinery and the, the expenses that you guys face as crop producers and as, as livestock dairy producers, uh, we realize that those expenses have gone up. And in the same discussion, we want to make sure that we're, you're, you're getting the most out of that land that you own and operate. And that's really what our, our comments are uh, today about. Uh, one of the first things I want to talk to you about is how do we improve our alfalfa yields? And how we improve our, improve our alfalfa yields is to do a, uh, several little things, as I like to call it, a lot of little things, if you do those right, they add up to make a uh, pretty substantial yield. And if you think about the price of uh, corn, which all you guys know what the price of corn is lately compared to six months or two months or three months or a year ago, all you, all you guys know what the price of beans are and you know what the prices are. If you look at the price of hay or the value of alfalfa, the value of alfalfa basically in the Midwest, and I cover the, the, the Midwest uh, for Winfield, you know, if you look at the value of alfalfa, it's, it's remained very valuable uh, from a marketing standpoint. The challenge I think we have is that a lot of our producers don't really buy or sell alfalfa very much. They buy or sell, or basically sell milk, right? Or you sell beef animals, or you sell, you sell livestock. And so I think one of the challenges in alfalfa that we have is that to help our growers to kind of internalize and think about how can you increase your alfalfa yield by a small amount on your farm, the economic impact that has by either more pounds of milk that you can ship or higher quality alfalfa you can produce uh, changing your dairy rations just a little bit or more pounds of beef shipped or those types of things, right? So this whole alfalfa yield thing is really, really important. And as we think about alfalfa, we think about corn yield. Some of you may be a member of the a high yield corn club. We're trying to raise 300 bushel corn. Some of you may be uh, members of the, the bean club where we try to raise 100 bushel beans. I think that every grower in Wisconsin that has alfalfa on your farm needs to be a member of the 10 ton alfalfa club. And so this whole idea of increasing alfalfa, and a lot of uh, growers struggle with that statement that I just made, but one of the things I feel pretty strongly about is that whatever yield you have on your farm right now, I believe there's another 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds or another ton of hay coming from each of these acres that you own and operate right now. And that basically is basically a fixed cost to own that acre, right? So anything that we can do to help fertility or in insect control or uh, stand densities, those are the three things that I want to talk about here in the next few minutes. First thing I want to talk to you about is really this whole thing about insect control. And insect control is really, really an important. You want to give us a little insect net demonstration there? So what Jeremy's going to do is he's going to sweep this alfalfa and give you just a little demonstration of what we do as agronomists to actually pick up insects in the canopy of the alfalfa. And if we don't know what is actually in this alfalfa, we don't know what to, what to spray or how we're going to help you increase this alfalfa yield. Now at this time of the year, we basically have an insect that's actually uh, what we call a migratory insect that's coming into the Wisconsin uh, alfalfa fields called potato leafhopper. And potato leafhoppers have been around for a long time. They've been, uh, they're very notorious for damaging alfalfa. They cause a lot of injury. I don't know, did you get, catch any? So what Jeremy's gonna do is you can see how he's peeling that net open and we're letting those insects out and as they come out, we're counting them, we're taking an observation of what actually is in that canopy, okay? And so a lot of you uh, raise alfalfa quite often. We see alfalfa that's either stunted, you see alfalfa that's kind of short or uneven. And then the worst of all, you see alfalfa that's really uh, yellow. And that yellow alfalfa is an indication that potato leafhopper has already started to feed on the alfalfa. And if you see alfalfa that's yellow and starting to turn uh, yellow in color, the damage is already done. 
spraying at that point is, is really too late. So the main thing is, is that the sweep net helps us as agronomists help you, you guys as growers to do a good job of managing for a potato leaf hopper. And even though we've known about this insect for a lot of years, it's one of these things we really need to pay attention to uh, as we try to manage uh, high yielding alfalfa. Another, th another thing too is populations are rising right now. I mean they haven't been very high a couple weeks ago, but populations on leaf hoppers are going up. You know, so here. You want to be having your guys out there checking the fields because they're, they're flying in the populations are. So I just got back from southern Iowa yesterday and we were talking to growers down there and looking at alfalfa fields. And those fields are actually, uh, the guys have not sprayed, those fields are turning yellow already. You can see them, they're, they're being very damaged. So generally, uh, they, they're basically an insect that we call them a migratory. They basically move from the south to the north and they'll basically distribute in the wind patterns that we get in the summertime here in uh, June, July, and August. And they basically spread out and then cause a lot of problems uh, for your alfalfa. So the numbers, like Jeremy said, those numbers are creeping up. If you have uh, certainly warmer temperatures, insects are warm body uh, beings, so when they uh, have warmer temperatures, uh, they re reproduce faster. So if we get warm weather, they can come on very quickly. The two things you need to watch for in alfalfa will be on your uh, established alfalfa, any alfalfa in the month of July or August. It's two to three inches in uh, regrowth, whether it's your second crop regrowth or your third crop regrowth or your fourth crop regrowth, doesn't matter. As long as you have, if you have alfalfa that's two to three inches tall, you better be out there having someone check it for you. So it's really important this time of year to watch that. And the other uh, crop you need to time in alfalfa you need to watch is new seedings. Any new seeding alfalfa, and that includes your alfalfa that's under oats. And I know no one here in this audience has oats for grain, but that alfalfa that's under that oats is uh, being uh, potentially being damaged by potato leaf hoppers. So make sure we're uh, observing that uh, population as that potentially goes up and we can get that sprayed. Also, yep. okay. also multiple pests. We're not just looking just at leaf hoppers. There could be there could be other other things out there. It's not just that. Like there was a Japanese beetle in that net too. Uh, one of the insects, just to follow up on that, there's quite a bit of plant bug damage out here, and I'll pass a few of these around if you want to kind of take a look at these. But these are basically plant bug injury, uh, Japanese beetles. I mean, there's a lot of things that cause alfalfa to get that, uh, what I call it, kind of crinkled up uh, leaf appearance. Some of those, uh, some of those leaves you can see uh, have have that appearance. So, okay. So, so the insect piece is really important. Uh, one of the insecticides that works really well for controlling insects in alfalfa is called Arctic Insecticide. Arctic in the Winfield brand does a nice job of knocking down those insects. Very safe for people, very safe for uh, animals or livestock, but it's deadly on insects. So it's a really a nice insecticide that we uh, recommend to use to control uh, those insects in your alfalfa. Okay? Any questions I think I've said? Okay. So the other pieces I want to talk to you about is that when you spray insects, you can also put other things in that spray tank. Uh, we have a little program uh, at Winfield called the Greater Acre. And the Greater Acre is really about getting the right nutrients on, getting insect control in addition to the nutrients on, on that alfalfa. And the, uh, the nutrients, one of the nutrients that we are really uh, concerned about in the summertime now would be boron. If you've not been using boron in your spray programs, that would be something you want to add to your insecticide. Uh, in, that in that spray tank. And boron is really important. We have a little program called NutraSolutions. We can actually do a tissue analysis and find out what that level of boron is in the plant tissue and then make a recommendation to, to spray that for uh, with the nutrient. And so boron is really important. When it gets hot and dry or it gets hotter and drier in the summertime, a lot of our soils become uh, deficient in boron and we can give that extra uh, shot of boron uh, with our insecticide application. Okay. As long as I'm on the, the spray tank topic, we also can put in a product called Ascend on alfalfa, which is a growth promoter. That works really well uh, when we spray alfalfa also. So you've got uh, some options uh, to put in that spray tank. And then uh, finally, and very, very importantly, is, is uh, fungicides. Fungicides in general, and, and maybe some of you experience working with the headline product, uh, is one of the fungicides that's available. And I don't know if you want to pull, pull that picture up. This guy, is this, uh, we did this check. Um, it was did it actually on first and second crop. This is actually done on first crop. And it was done up in Barneveld up there at uh, Kevin Imes' place, uh, True Blue Registered Holsteins. So basically the dry matter was more. The crude protein surprisingly was two points higher. 
Um, total value is 136 bucks an acre. So with the cost of the application and that, this was actually, we did it with the helicopter, it was flew on, um, it was a 2.98 return on investment to one. So, so it was a huge, huge this year, fungicides on alfalfa. So. And what we sprayed on that, and this check was headline, at six ounces, max in ZMB, that's zinc, manganese, boron, there's a little sulfur with it. Uh, we put two ounces of Ascend, which is your growth regulator, and we put five ounces of Arctic in there with your drift agent is what we put on there. So, so the economics of this uh, whole process we call the Greater Acre, which includes uh, all the products Jeremy just mentioned, is really think about incrementally increasing the height of this alfalfa like that picture shows. Anybody want to guess what an inch of alfalfa, how many, how many pounds per acre that really is? No one, think ever, but no one ever thinks about these kind of things other than guys like me that are alfalfa products, right? So that's worth about 200 pounds, okay? So an acre inch of alfalfa, every time you add an inch of that alfalfa, it's worth about 200 pounds, maybe more, maybe less. But as, as you think about increasing that alfalfa height, you increase that alfalfa yield dramatically. So it doesn't take long when we uh, look at these fields, like the, this demonstration shows, uh, this increasing this alfalfa three to four inches uh, can be very dramatic in terms of economics uh, for alfalfa. Now, when you think that through economically, I want to make sure that we're all thinking about this properly, is that if you look at the price of hay right now, tested hay auctions across the Midwest, the price of hay has probably been staying up around 170, 180, uh, pushing even $200 a ton. And again, back to my previous comment, where as dairy farmers, we don't sell hay, we sell milk. And so we have to really think about that extra three inches of hay, four inches of hay, five inches of hay by using these treatments, what's that worth? And if you look at increasing alfalfa yields by, let's say, a thousand pounds per acre, which doesn't sound like that much, but if hay is $200 a ton, a half a ton is a hundred dollar bill per acre of increased income and yield per acre, okay? We don't think about alfalfa that way in Wisconsin, do we? We think about, we, we know about yields in corn, we know about yields of soybeans, but we don't think about alfalfa that way. So I'm kind of ch change the, the uh, change the world one audience at a time, if you will, but that extra thousand pounds of hay is worth another hundred bucks per acre. And so when we look at the cost of doing these treatments, they're relatively small. I think if you do the math on this, yesterday we did a calculation on this, uh, same yeah, type of treatment it was about uh, what was it? Forty-six bucks. Yeah, 40, 45, 46 bucks for that treatment, and we're, we're uh, grossing about a hundred dollars per acre on thousand pounds yield, roughly. And any time you can piggyback stuff together, it's it may, the benefit is more. You know, if you got insects, it does hurt to throw a ZMB in or a headline or something like that. When when you did that work, now did you do tissue samples before you did that applications? We did. We didn't in this case. Second crop we did. I mean that's one thing too is guys we, we tissue test corn and beans all the time, but we need to be doing alfalfa. Too. So so one thing because how would you know whether you put something on there that didn't need to be? That's right. exactly yeah. a, that's a wonderful question, and that's what we need to do. As agronomists, we are here to help you do that. So for your farm and your situation, the principle behind this, what we call the greater acre, is that your greater acre and your needs on your farm are different than the greater acre on this gentleman's farm. So our job is our job as a team is to help you fine tune that whether you need that need that input or not. Okay. So the ascend, you have to put that on like after every crop? Every, or is that every crop, yeah. Anytime the alfalfa is actively growing, anytime you have good moisture, anytime you have a plant that's that's really starting to, everything's just right there starting to really grow, and you want to turn that up just a little bit, that's what a send does. It makes the cells divide and grow faster. And so a send, if it's if it's a little drought stress, it's not going to work. If you're not controlling insects, it's not going to work. If you have any degree of stress there, any kind, the send is not going to give you a, a, a benefit. One of the things that I like to talk about is really this whole thing about stand density and nutrient credits to alfalfa, or to corn crops from alfalfa. And one of the things that I, I like to mention is that stand density, by the way, it's as good as the magic show gets, okay? Uh, one of the things I like to talk about is stand density, and even though we talk about this a lot, I still think it needs to be reviewed, is that we need to have about 50 stems per square foot for high yielding alfalfa. And here in Wisconsin, where we, uh, like last year, we had some winter kill, and I get that, we still need to come back and ask ourselves uh, this summer and next next uh, next year on our stands, 
what do those stands actually look like and do we have enough density to keep that stand in production next year and the science behind this is really the fact that we need to have 50 stems per square foot once you get to 50 stems per square foot we know that we bought we maximize yield as you drop off past 50 then these uh, numbers start to decline and our yields go down and then it really doesn't matter what your fer fertilizer or herbicide programs are then we don't maximize yield so 50 stems per square foot is kind of our take-home uh, message you can get these rings from our team here uh, we have uh, have more of these if you want want to uh, take uh, take I think the agronomist can help you with these. The other piece of this discussion that I think is really interesting to show folks is that what you can do with alfalfa crowns is we can split these open. And a lot of times we don't think about plants as having portion of uh, half of the plant is below the ground. In the case of alfalfa, 75 to 80 percent of this plant is below the ground, right? So you have to actually take and split these roots open and take a, take a look at them and see what's going on below, below the ground. The other thing I can show you on this crown, I just happened to dig this like this. What do you think happened to the other half of this crown? What do you think happened to the other half of that? Well, probably a wheel track destroyed that side of the plant. So this is a good time also to evaluate your, your uh, harvest process. If you are causing a lot of wheel tracks in your alfalfa, and certainly this uh, is a demonstration, you see tracks out there, uh, but that is a, is a damaging feature on, on that alfalfa. So don't forget that stand density of alfalfa, we need to have about 50 stems per square foot. The other question that comes up, how many plants is that? Historically, we need about five plants per square foot. Five plants per square foot to maximize our alfalfa yield, or about 50 stems is where we want to be for, for high yielding alfalfa. Okay? Maybe touch on cover crops a little bit. Um, cover crops and alfalfa. Uh, so the next little piece you want to talk about here in the next uh, last five minutes is Roundup Ready Alfalfa and using cover crops and, and some of those types of things. So the things that we feel are really important about alfalfa is that you have to get a stand. And just like I mentioned here with 50, uh, 50 stems per square foot, is extremely important, extremely important to get a stand of alfalfa. The Roundup Ready technology is a wonderful technology to help you get an alfalfa stand. Roundup Ready Alfalfa has one feature and really one feature only, and it's to help alfalfa growers to get a consistent stand. And so the products that you see behind behind me here is the Stratica, Tunica, uh, Apatron, Maxipro. Those products are all Roundup Ready alfalfas. And what they do for us is that during the establishment of alfalfa, uh, a lot of the weeds and a lot of competition uh, basically kills or destroys a large percentage of those alfalfa seedlings. Using the Roundup Ready system, you can get all those weeds out of there, get the stand off to a great start. Now, I will comment uh, my, my little uh, take on the, on the previous co speaker's comments. I just want to share something with you. Alfalfa was not specifically mentioned, but we did mention amaranth. She mentioned amaranth and pigweed and some of those types of things. Alfalfa is a multiple cut, multiple harvested crop. We're basically cutting that alfalfa mechanically. We're taking a crop every 20 or 30 days. A lot of the weed resistance that we've seen in the Midwest have been where? It's been in corn and soybeans. To our knowledge, we're, we're not developing resistance of weeds in alfalfa because we're basically mechanically cutting that crop off every 20 or 30 days. So the point about a resistance, we feel in, in Roundup Ready Alfalfa is going to be less of a concern in Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Incidentally, we don't get Roundup resistant weeds by spraying the, the weeds in the field. We get resistance by what? How does resistance occur? It occurs when weeds go to seed, right? So when we harvest alfalfa mechanically, if there's a pigweed or an amaranth or one of these uh, weeds that was mentioned, basically those are all fairly tall growing weed species. They're basically cut off before they have a chance to to come into uh, a production as far as producing resistant weeds. So I want to be very clear with our audiences that we feel very strongly that Roundup Ready Alfalfa is a great technology and it's a great addition to uh, our uh, establishment programs for alfalfa using, using, this, uh, using this, this technology. Now back to Jeremy's question to me about cover crops. We would still recommend in Wisconsin that you use a light crop of oats. And by light crop of oats, I mean probably three quarter to one bushel of oats. And you have a couple options here. One of the new systems using cover crops for Roundup Ready Alfalfa establishment is to put your oats in. You can also use a rye, uh, a rye grass if you wanted to as maybe an option here. Uh, but you can also use oats at three quarter of a bushel. Let the oats get up to about this tall. Somewhere between about probably four to six inches. Not too tall. If, 
if they get, that was my five minutes. So if they get too tall, then they, they uh, are going to cause problems where you fall over on the alfalfa. If you've not experienced Roundup Ready Alfalfa, we'd really recommend that you uh, use a three-quarter bushel rate, no more than a bushel, let the oats get up to about uh, three to six inches tall and spray them out. And what that does for you is it gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you the soil erosion control, both wind and water, and it gives you the chance to let that little alfalfa seedling come up through that dead and dying oat, and you cannot believe how nice those alfalfa stands will look uh, if you use that system. The other portion of that discussion is actually what we call a stubble spray. If you get a wet spring like we had this year and you you plan to take that oats off and, and you spray them out when it's uh, fairly small and it starts raining every other day and you can't get out there to spray it because the ground is just simply too wet to drive on, then we let that oats grow a little taller and we take it off for oldage, take that to the heifers and dry cows, and then what we'll do is we'll come back and spray the stubble. We have a lot of mis, uh, misconception with Roundup Ready Alfalfa. If I want to plant oats as a cover crop, I can't use Roundup Ready Alfalfa. That is absolutely not true. We'd still use three-quarter bushel oats, bushel of oats maybe. Then we come in and we let that oats go to oatage, take it in the boot stage. Don't let it go to grain. Don't let it go to soft dough. Take it in the boot stage, get it off the field, come back and spray the stubble. You can mix a little insecticide in there at the same time because that's about the same time the leaf hoppers drop in. And we can have off to the races with a beautiful stand of alfalfa. Incidentally, you get a, about at about 60 days, um, maybe maybe 70, 70 days, you could probably be taking your first crop of alfalfa uh, from the time you get that oats slowed up and killed, uh, then you're taking your first crop of alfalfa. Uh, so in the Wisconsin market, we're taking two really nice cuttings, if not three, really nice cuttings of alfalfa uh, that first year on new seeding alfalfa. It's one of the biggest costs we have in alfalfa, uh, raising alfalfa in Wisconsin in the upper Midwest, is that we just don't get our yields up soon enough to be competitive with corn and, corn and soybeans. So I, my feeling is as the staff agronomist, Roundup Ready Alfalfa is a great way to improve your alfalfa yields in those first years, get a great stand, and then you're ready, you're ready to produce alfalfa for the next two or three years on that great stand of, of Roundup Ready Alfalfa. The products that we have here that I've mentioned to you briefly would be Stratica. Stratica is a great high yielding alfalfa for the upper Midwest. If you want to have a great, great yielding alfalfa, uh, in this part of the country, uh, Stratic is an excellent product for you. Uh, it is basically in the Rebound family. Those of you that worked with Rebound, uh, then the Stratica has the Roundup Ready gene added to it. Uh, the Afatron product gives us a little more wet soil resistance, great on the wet soils. Uh, would be a, a bookend of Stratica with a little more, a little more uh, horsepower, if you will, on the wet soil in the race two of Phantomiasis. If you have heard uh, pathologists talk about Phantomiasis, it basically takes off the root hairs takes off some nodules and we lose yield uh, if you have a phantomyces on our soils where we have alfalfa uh, quite a, in uh, quite a few of our soils in tight, fairly tight rotation, uh, then a phantomyces may be a concern to you. Uh, the new five dormancy materials, which would be our Tunica product, our conventional product in here is Gunner, uh, would be the, uh, the, the, twin, the twin product to uh, Tunica is the Roundup version and Gunner would be the, uh, the five dormancy conventional. Uh, these are excellent, excellent alfalfas. Uh, four or five dormancy. If you're uh, trying to get uh, four cuts and trying to go to five cuts of alfalfa maybe on your farm, uh, these would be excellent products for you to try here in, in southern Wisconsin. Uh, I like to say uh, our, our fours and fives, both the Stratic and the Tunica, end of May, end of June, end of July, end of August would be our cutting scenario uh, for, for these type of products. Uh, four or five years ago, if I was standing here talking to you about these five dormancies, they were not winter hardy enough be grown in, in southern Wisconsin and now uh, these newer varieties are extremely winter hardy. We went through some really tough winters uh, in our research program making sure that they uh, are excellent uh, producing products for us uh, here in this part of the country. Okay, So uh, those, are the, those are the main products I think in this plot that I wanted, wanted to review with you. So, One thing to add to the Roundup Ready Alfalfa which, which some people get confused is Especially in the direct seeding, you know, we got to be spraying it 28 days. I mean, there's too many guys that say, well, it ain't going to be yet, but it's got to be before it gets in. That's, that's the purpose of it is, and what is it, what percent is, is not around the pretty elk? Oh, so uh, technically there's, uh, there's going to be about uh, 2 to 4 percent of the plants that, that do not carry the Roundup gene. And that's a plant breeding thing. It's not a seed blending thing. It's basically a complicated story. But the breeding of alfalfa is much different than corn or soybeans. And so there's about 2% of the plants that uh, we need to take out early so they are, are not in that stand 
as that uh, stand uh, comes into production. So we want to take, the, take those out. Okay. You're in the root pit. So guess what we talk about in the root pit? Roots. <clears throat> we got roots on corn plants here that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk a little bit about soybeans at the end. Um, I'm going to... I'm Larry Feeney and, and I'm the business manager for Wisconsin for Winfield and uh, my, my, one of my jobs is to look at all the new stuff that we have every year and look at all the new things that we have in progress to try and evaluate what we're going to go forward with. Paul Hen does that on the genetic side and, and I get to do that on the fertilizer, crop protection, uh, micronutrients, growth regulators, biologicals and, and all those different areas of development. So. In this trial, what you're sitting in right now is a, a treatment where we have, uh, the, and, and this is a very high fertility trial first, I'll tell you a little bit about the soil and what we're on here. So we're, we're sitting on a, on a plain, uh, Plano silt loam soil, which in this particular area is about 73% of all the soils that are farmed right here in this area. And, and that's the reason that we had this plot selected. It took them about six months to, fi to find the spot that they wanted to locate the plot in. Uh, for this test plot about five years ago because we wanted to find one that had plain old silt loam soil because it was such a, it's it's so dominant in the area. There's so much of this particular soil type. So it's, all, it's a very good soil. From a fertility standpoint, it's a very good soil. Um, we've got, if you, if you were here a few years ago, you saw the root pit. We've got about three feet of high CDC soil, well-drained soil. It sits on top of a, uh, a small layer of loosely unconsolidated glacial till, which is also known as gravel. So we have gravel, a little gravel, about six inches of that. Underneath that, we got a little bit of clay, and we got a little bit more sand under below that. Okay. So really, from a from a water holding capacity standpoint, it's a good soil. It's not a bad soil in terms of holding moisture. Um, as far as the, the whole region goes, it's one of the better soils for holding moisture. You know, Rick, Rick Hen is here, he's got some soil that doesn't hold any moisture on his farm, but he also has some of this soil on the farm and he appreciates every acre that he has of it probably. So this soil has got a good nutrient supply power to it. Um, it's, it's quite high fertility because we had a dairy farm across the road that probably hauled a lot of manure here on this particular farm over the years. So our phosphate levels are high, our potash levels are very high, so we have good fertility. We would expect not to see probably a huge response from starter fertilizer because we have such good fertility on this farm, but we always do. We always get a really good response on starter fertilizers on this farm. So what you're looking at here is six rows of untreated on the left, and the way that we put this plot in, and these other trials that you see down here with the experimentals, is uh, they planted the trial, and then they cut a slot in the ground, and they slid in plywood, okay? And then they buried it back up. Two days ago, the interns came out with shovels. We, don't, we never let them get away with much, <laughs> interns. They gotta learn how to use a two, number two dirt shovel. So they came out with shovels, and they scooped out this stuff. Now, we did bring a bobcat in later to scoop the dirt that they had scooped out of the way. So they, they dug down in, and then they removed all the plywood so we can see what the root systems look like behind it. And if you look at how they looked in here, the roots on the right hand side that had the uh, starter treatment on it, that starter was uh, 721.7, I think with uh, zinc and scent, five gallons per acre pop up on the row, and uh, a quart of zinc and 4.5 ounces of scent. So I think what we had on this on the trial on the right hand side. So as that, as that corn seed imbibed that starter fertilizer and that zinc and that ascent, it started to grow pretty rapidly. It started to throw roots out. And we want plants to jump out of the ground pretty fast, especially if we're a little late planting like we were on this trial. We also weren't planting in good conditions. We had, we had a window, we thought, to get this plot planted, and it, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and then we saw another window, and we thought we were going to get into this plot and get it planted, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. So about the first week of May, we said, you know, if we get a day and it's dry enough, we better get that plant, that, that plot planted. You guys ever have this happen where you're up 
know, you got this short, and it just, everything's going away on you. So we had a Saturday that looked good. We got out here and it wasn't great. The ground was still a little bit, a little bit wet to plant in, but we decided there was rain in the forecast for that afternoon. We better start getting this thing planted. So we, we turned the planter loose on here. We worked the ground once just with a, with a saw finisher and planted it. It wasn't perfect. We were lucky because we we packed we sidewalk and packed this when we planted it. We were lucky because the day after we planted it, it rained about an inch, and then three days later it rained about two inches. Then it rained again about a week later, and it never quit raining. So we never had those sidewalls tighten up on us and dry out and hold that good in place. They stayed soft the whole time. So the roots broke out through that compaction layer that we put in when we planted it. And they got some exposure to the soil, and they got in that high fertility phosphate and potash, and they started to grow pretty rapidly. So we had good growth on the spot. But there was a period of time there when it was questionable. We came out and looked at it, and we weren't sure. If it had dried out for another four or five days, if we'd have had a week of, of just straight dry hot weather in here, this plot would look a lot different than it does today. All the moisture we had really saved us in this particular plot this year because of the mistakes we made. But that starter program really helped those roots bust out and get going and get exposed, and it helped those plants jump up. So we had the interns come in at about V5 when the corn was about this tall, and they dug up corn plants in all the plots, all these trials in here, and they cut them off at the ground level, and they washed them, and they weighed the roots separate from the tops of the plants to see what the roots weighed versus what the top portion of these plants weighed. The overall weight of each plant was about 50% higher in the where we had the starter on. Weighed 50% more than the plants that were untreated. That was a big deal for us at that point because we want corn as big as we can get it before the longest day of the year so those leaves are as wide as they can be, get as much energy as they can and really get going. What it equated to later was, and if you look at this a little bit, if you look at this trial a little bit, and you walk in here, and you and you just snap off some corn plants, what you'll find today is, I'll hand these around, you'll find stalks in the uh, in the treated area that are much bigger than the stalks are in the untreated area because the plants got going and they they got some diameter to them and they just kept moving forward and, and growing. The tassels popped out on this treated area three days ahead of the corn that was untreated. So the untreated corn started to catch up, we think, because it looked like it was going to be a lot worse than that. When the corn was about two feet tall in here, there was about a six inch to eight inch height difference between the treated with starter versus the untreated corn in here. And what that, what that told us was that corn was getting early, good early nutrition and probably we could have cut corn open at that time, but we didn't, to check the embryonic ears and see how big the, the ears were. But we think that when we see them now, as we see these ears emerge, probably that starter treated corn is gonna have some of those bigger ears, 16, 18 round on it. Because when that corn is small, is when it determines how big that ear is. We think it's set a pretty good ear on the treated, uh, starter treated corn. The untreated corn, we're thinking maybe we lost a couple couple and then if you lose one one row of, of doubles one row of doubles is 33 bushels of corn okay that's a lot of corn to miss going from a six from an 18 down to a 16 same length same number of ears 33 bushel difference that's huge so you want to have you want to set a bigger ear early and you want to feed that corn later when you get to the optimized acres down here what they did was they carried that through we didn't carry through with this trial. This trial starter only. Down there, they did our starter program and then they side dressed the corn. So they put nitrogen on with a little sulfur down here to keep that corn growing and going and really moving forward. And uh, there's more brown silk down there because it is it did move along and it's it got ahead of some of our starter trials because it got treated right. So we've got bigger corn plants in here, bigger root systems. And that'll make a big difference for us, we think, late in the season. Uh, right now, as a corn is pulling hard to start filling these ears up. 
we need to get as much potash and nitrogen moved as possible. And that root system that's big under that ground can suck in all that nutrition and all that moisture that it needs to keep that plant healthy at this stage. There's probably less disease in here. We don't know that yet in the treated area because generally corn plants that are growing rapidly, that are healthy, have a lot less disease. They have less tendency to have anthracnose, less tendency to have fusarium down in the crown portion. They're a healthier corn plant. But we'll know that as this develops because these will start to die a little earlier if that's the case. We'll see some other differences uh, in the trials. We're gonna switch over a little bit here. We got Pete Bonin who works for Premier and Pete does a lot of stuff. Uh, he does a lot of his own work, does a lot of his own trials on different things, starter fertilizers, dry, split applications, that type of thing, and likes to see a lot of stuff on his own with his own eyes. So we brought Pete in to kind of give his impression on starter fertilizers because Platteville is even a little further south in an area where you might not expect to see much starter impact because it's on deep soils, it has, it has very high fertility, you know, you don't have the, the kind of uh, maybe some of the uh, variation in soil types that we do in this part of the world up here. So, you know, you might not expect to, it's more like Illinois ground where they don't use much starter fertilizer. It's, it's, a, it's a heavier ground, but Pete's done some work down there and has seen some pretty, pretty good opportunities with starter programs. And then Melissa McDonald is the uh, agronomist for Mycogen, and she's going to talk a little bit about roots and then we'll be out of time, I'm pretty sure, because I've talked too long. So go ahead, Pete, tell us a little bit about your program. Um, our typical liquid starter program in Platteville is uh, XLR rate uh, 723.5 uh, with 9% uh, zinc, and most guys are running a capture, possibly some ascend, and a micro pack, all depending on how much uh, um, investment they want in their crop. I have a couple guys that have put some fungicide in um, compared to, uh, and so that's in furrow. And then I have some guys that are doing 2x2, uh, two two, um, 618.6 with sulfur and zinc, maybe 618.6 uh, with no sulfur and zinc. And they're doing that at about 10 gallons the acre, 2x2. Two two. The in furrow is no more than 5 gallons uh, to the acre. Uh, we've got some uh, dry products we picked up this year. Premier started to um, sell from Mosaic Company called Mez. Um, it's a DAP with fused sulfur and zinc on it. There's a, another. There's a potash product called Aspire, but that won't be used in furrow or in the soil necessarily yet with the boron on it. Uh, but we've seen uh, some great results with the uh, with the Mez so far. We got one guy that uh, has three has it on three different hybrids. The Mez, we uh, was a 92330. Instead of the DAP, we just put the Mez with it. So you got a little bit less nitrogen, a little bit less P, but you got the zinc and the sulfur. The uh, split where he split the planter out, he walked or drove to the field to spray it that one day, and he goes uh, something wrong with half my field. He sprayed his farm and uh, realized that that was where he did his split at. The width of the Mez was almost a full collar ahead of the straight 92330. So um, he's hoping that when it comes time to harvest that he's seeing that great result with that. Um, back on the liquid side, I've got some growers that are doing some different things. Um, some they're reading on the internet, um, getting stuff from us asking my opinion if they if I think it should work or not. We're not doing it on their whole whole field, we're just doing little trials here and there. Um, Larry and I talked earlier this spring about a product and uh, he goes, well that might work but you don't want to do that. Well I sent him some pictures and he goes, that wasn't supposed to do that. This grower uh, was on, on his beans. I don't know how many of you use uh, liquid starter. Typically if you use liquid starter you go plant your beans, you just uh, cut the rate back, cut it with some water, whatever, to empty the planter out. Well, um, I know there's some products out there on the market for beans. Um, we're trying one that's kind of new to the market. Uh, we've been using a lot of it in, in, at Platteville and a bunch of trials. Um, so that's, at, after this fall, we'll know some more results on that. But uh, this one was four gallons of water uh, with this product on beans, no-till. The beans were almost a full note ahead. Um, 
with the treatment than without and we did run the water on the other treatment just to keep it the same so um, it's hard to believe that this at a, at a quart made this big of a difference but um, when it comes time for yield hopefully we'll I'll tell you if it was a good idea or if we just drowned some beans and made everybody feel warm and fuzzy for the beginning of the year so um, any questions on any starter programs or what you guys have tried that think you work great or Melissa all right well um, so we've talked about starter and you know, all these things we can do to make sure we get you know a really great factory under the ground so that we can feed the real factory which is the above ground portion that year so I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach what do you think the difference is uh, between these two? Yeah. Root worm, hey, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so I would, I'd like to focus on traits during this portion. So, um, you know, I'm an agronomist, I'm in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, and every year I put out corn rootworm trials. What I'm really trying to do is gauge the population, make sure that our traits are working just like we expect them to and you know probably do it across four or five different areas so I do 100% smart sacks a 95.5 refuge blend which as you know is what our current um, refuge requirement is for smart sacks and then a 90-10 and a straight roundup and this year I threw in a VT3 the same hybrid in a couple different locations so the the results may be a little bit startling my first one, Kersher, Illinois. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys know where that is, but it's quite a bit further south of here on the eastern half of the state. And I did that on soybean ground. You know, they got a lot of press from the University of Illinois and Mike Gray at the University of Illinois for the heavy pressure in that area. And you know, when we think about it, whenever we hear about root one, we're mostly always talking about eastern Iowa and northern Illinois. So that's when it started to get interesting. Yesterday, actually, hot off the press, really. Um, that's when I dug these roots. They're in Platteville. So I had pretty similar results, you know, obviously not this severe in Delavan, Wisconsin, which is not terribly far from Lake Geneva. So um, I'm not sure. Anyone pretty familiar with the Iowa State rating scale for corn rootworm injury? So I grade this about three. 2.83. So the way it works, we've got three nodes of roots. And so for every node put back, that would be a one. Two nodes, two. A three, three nodes, that's the highest level of damage. And we need to get a little bit more detailed here and put a decimal there. So the number after the decimal place notes the injury on the next on the next node. So, you know, there's really, I mean, you got a little bit of something here, but you know, at the end of the day, it's it's pretty severe. You can tell, do you think these were lodged? Do you think these brace roots just like to grow like that? <laughs> yeah, so we saw some lodging. Um, and you know, even before we started to dig the roots, um, we looked and we saw plants that were stressed. I mean, their leaves were rolled. They were shorter. They just didn't look as healthy. So that's reinforcing, again, the purpose of getting a really nice root mass underneath the plant. So. You know, a lot of times I get calls that, oh, my, you know, my corn has a little test weight or it's fallen over. And then I look on the map, I see where they're at, I get familiar with their area, I dig some roots. And a lot of times we don't notice it because what happens, these plants, they don't have enough underneath that they want to fill out that year. So they start cannibalizing that bottom portion of the stalk. And that's when you start to see the plant runs out of steam, we get low test weight, we get lodging, um, kind of get a mess on our hands. So. All right, three different trait packages here. This one here, like I said before, this is straight Roundup. There's no insecticide in corn on corn. So I wanted to gauge the pressure in a little bit more extreme situation in this field. And you can see we've got you know, 2.8, three nodes removed. Pretty rough. This one, you guys, first of all, are you familiar with smart stacks and the below ground protection in that? There's two modes of action. Anyone want to rattle off those proteins? I know you know them. 
So it's cry through BB1 is the Monsanto portion and Herculox version or Dowager Sciences um, protein is cry 34, 35, AB1. So who wants to tell me which one has two and which one has one? No takers? Well, it's actually the smart sex right here in this hand. Um, you know, we can tell we, we have a full node removed here. Um, you know, one, maybe 1 1.5, you could rate this one as. So you're going to start to see some yield differences, again, because we're compromising, um, you know, our nutrient uptake. So, you know, if you're in a situation like this, what do you think? Is it harder for a corn rootworm to overcome two traits at once or one trait? It's more deadly for them. The two? The two. Yeah. So thinking about traits that are going to let, you know, you've got two traits and you want them to work for a long time, right? But I've got another question for you. Okay. Two years ago I had corn that looked like that. It was as agri-sure as 3,000. Yep, that's a good point. Last year, where did the rootworms go? So that's the thing. I was actually just talking to our traits lead at Dow, AgroSciences, about this. And it's interesting because year to year, you know, you do... You know, I can go into a field. This one, next year I might put corn on it, maybe not have the same amount of pressure. Remember, we're always dealing with Mother Nature and we're always dealing with the environment. So, but there were saying, beetles you could walk out there that are like mosquitoes at night. So what, what trait did you, what did you put out there this year? Well, it was beans last year, mm -hmm. but it had volunteer corn in it, and the volunteer corn went not touch mm -hmm. as far as the roof was there. And this year, now I, I use a non-genetic, no, uh, just, just Roundup corn, okay. because it was following bean ground. And I did not have any beetle pressure last year, mm -hmm. so there should not be much for eggs there. It can, be, it can be interesting, depending on the beetles, you know, a lot of times what I've seen is, say your neighbor planted really late, and his was behind your your field. All those beetles will flock to that field and that will be a trap crop. So that kind of takes some of the pressure off of you. You know, that doesn't explain every situation. But you know, sometimes when we, we have problem fields, sometimes fields that have never had a problem the next year will see it. It's just, you know, the thing of dealing with an insect. But you know, the AgriSure three thousand GT, that the M Cry three A, that trait in there. We have seen cross resistance of cry through BB1 as well. So that's a good point that kind of brings me to is, you know, stacking those traits together first. You know, you wouldn't ever find those in the stack together, but stacking multiple traits together is going to make that stronger. So you're not just relying on one. So, does that answer your question? Well, that's what we went to now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I think you'll be happy with that, and especially in an extreme situation where you start to, you know, start to see at least one node removed or more than that, um, you know, it, you'll be better off maybe thinking about using a soil applied insecticide. Granular's best. You're going to use capture a full rate of that. You know, I guess the kind of the whole point, you know, we want to make sure that we've got a nice solid root, and you know, when we when we have situations, that especially corn on corn, or where we think we might have a problem. It's, nice to pyramid those and use them in conjunction because that's just another part of the equation that's going to help us get our yield at the end of the day. These are treated versus untreated beans. So these are our, uh, this is on our optimized trial which you guys are going to next here. You're going to see a little difference. So seed treatment on these beans, uh, on, the, on these particular beans here. So this had the full Cruiser Max advanced with the new Sodexane on it. Okay. It also had a little sniff of a scent put on it on the soybeans. So not a, not a huge amount, I think it's an ounce per 100 uh, pounds of seed to get them to pop out of the ground a little bit more and get them to grow. These beans are in the, uh, in the trial. If you walk out on the optimized acre and you stand and look at where the common acre is versus the optimized acre, you can pretty much see the difference right there. Now, the optimized acre also has some other stuff on it. We've done some tissue sampling and we've done some spraying on those also to, to keep them healthy. But the main thing I was going to show you about, because we're in the root pit, is the roots on these beans. So if you look at the difference in these soybean roots between the uh, 
the treated beans and the untreated, what you'll find right away when you dig these out of the ground is these beans have a lot more nodules on them. They're, they're really, they have a ton of nodules. And nodules, they're, they're wonderful to have, but nodules is not a zero sum game for soybeans. Soybeans will generally allow, they let the rhizobia infect the roots. It's, a, it's an opportunity for the rhizobia to get in, but the beans can either elect to let rhizobia come in or no rhizobia come in, okay? So when you see all the nodules on there, sometimes it's because we have inoculant on the beans, but a lot of times it's because the beans are really hungry for nitrogen, super hungry. So they will allow, they'll open up themselves and say, come on in boys, get some nodules started here, we're starving, we need some nitrogen. And as they do that, they'll form more nodules. So in a no-till environment, how many of you guys have no-till beans? No-till into corn stalks. Yeah. You know how yellow your you know how yellow your beans look this year again or last year or the year before. I mean, no-tilled into stalks this year with all the rain we had, it rinsed a lot of the nitrogen out of the soil profile early. Those beans, if you go out and dig them right now, they have more nodules on them than I've ever seen on soybeans ever. The no-till into corn stalks. They're just loaded up with nodules. Those beans allowed all the nodulization they could stand, but now they have to feed those colonies. Now how do they feed them? They create synthate and sap that they feed down into those nodules, and that, that gives them the energy so that they can grow and live. As they grow and live, they also die, right? And that's how the beans get their nitrogen. There's a million of those microbes that are like little eggs that die every minute, and they crack open, and when they crack open inside of them, is all the protein and nitrogen that gets absorbed by those soybean plants. So the beans feed those uh, those colonies all through the season, and then late in the season, they're really mean. They shut off the food to the nodules, and they absorb all that nitrogen back into their system. And as they do that, you'll see those nodules in August, all of a sudden they just disappear. They'll just fade, turn brown, and they'll just, like, you can grab them, they're almost like you could, they're almost hollow. They just suck all of that nitrogen out of there and they get it in their system. So my prediction for this year is the no-till into corn stock beans will be as good as anything in the country. They looked ugly early, but I think that they were getting ready for August, which is when beans do all their yield, and they're, you're gonna see more nitrogen now move into those beans. If you, had, if you had beans out there right now at this time frame and they're still yellow, I would consider a late season application of nitrogen on my beans. If they're still yellow, there's a problem. I'd go dig them up and take a look at them or a tissue sample and find out what's causing the yellow color in the beans because right now, beans should be about as good looking as they're gonna be all year. They should be about as pretty and green as you're gonna get them right now at the end of July. And if they're not, I'd really, I'd really seriously go out and start diagnosing what could be out there. I look for good beans this year though. All the rain that we had, I thought we might have some serious problems. There are some diseases in beans this year, but overall at this point, n not near the amount of white mold we thought we could potentially have. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on too at the program. Uh, basically the common acre, I'll start there. That's just your standard corn program. Start a fertilizer, putting on your NP and K like you normally do. Planting at a standard population, 32, 34,000. Nothing special. There's no side dressing, no top dressing, there's no fungicides, there's no special programs going in with liquid starter, nothing like that. It's just a standard program versus the optimized acre, which is your starter liquid, starter fertilizers with the zinc and the sand put in it. You're going to be doing foliar applications of fungicide at the V5 and more than likely at uh, brown silk or tassel. Um, that's going to have foliar products like the Maxim Z and B and all that put on. Um, a lot of different things like that. Uh, big difference between the two, you can kind of see this side from the flag. If you look at the stalk diameter by itself, compared to that side, you see a lot bigger girthy stalks on the optimized acre side. Big question is cost comparison, right? What, what are uh, commodities at right now for corn? They're probably not so hot, right? So this is gonna cost you extra money to do this is your standard program. So you kind of have to weigh your options. Not necessarily is every acre on your farm going to be an optimized acre, but you can take from that playbook and place it on every acre on your farm to see what's going to work best or 
what you need to tweak where and, and, and that kind of stuff. So um, that's basically the program. Yeah, so. and I'll get back into it. And this for <clears throat> us is just a starting point. So we'll take some of this data and we'll try to, try to apply it to someone's farm to see if it actually works on the farm because not every farm is going to respond to certain different things. You know, soil type is going to play in the, in the uh, factor into that. So a lot of environmental conditions are taking a part of that. So that's just a start if you will. So, uh, I think, describe, Ken, how you kind of handle some of that with your growers. Well, we'll, we'll do, uh, example, yesterday we did a side-by-side, -side, uh, we put some urea on some soybeans, actually. Um, we'll, we do things, a lot of different things like that. That's one example. Uh, fungicides on corn, we'll do split side-by-sides um, -side on that. Uh, do a lot of side by side corn. Um, there's a bunch of different things you do. Uh, P and K, some P and K. Really do a whole lot with stir. That's pretty much a standard now. So we really don't do a whole lot with that. We're starting to do some stuff with biologicals. Um, but we, we try to do some testing on the farm because that's, I think that's where the real results are actually. So. Um. So yeah, I think as, as Ben Ben was you know commenting, uh, you know economics will, will play a play a big part in that. So what we're gonna you know end up doing is you know the yield data of the inputs that were you know put on here on the optimized acre, you know that those economics will play out and and probably you know if, if looking at that picture, you, you know and it's hard to say today you know how that that picture will come out. But there might have to be, you know, something in that that scenario that, you know, doesn't give you the return that that you want. Um, one thing too that we forgot, you know, probably mentioned too that this when we're treating this field the way this is laid out, we'll tissue sample it, you know, look for those micronutrients if it's sulfur or on a course is I mean, we probably don't hardly ever do a tissue sample right now on a optimum maker that boron is is high, so we find boron quite often short, you know, when we're foliar uh, testing. And um, so we will treat that based, you know, that optimized acre is treated based on, you know, what a tissue test, you know, is, is coming back back to us. And just because it's the highest yielding soil, that doesn't mean that's the most optimized acre. It could be a sand field. Just optimizing nitrogen on a sand field is considered optimizing that acre. So it's not all, every fungicides, insects and everything. It might just be end, just side dressing. Managing, managing, managing exactly. that end. Exactly. So, so, you guys have any uh, questions on uh, anything? Because this is a quick stop for you. And down in our area, we're actually have seen a lot of poor nodulation of soybeans, and so we've, uh, you know, treated, uh, you know, it's actually been a fair amount of acres this this year because of poor nodulation of those of those beans too. So, and up in my area, Roger and I are actually going to be doing some application here once we get full pods. So, so some nitrogen to see what we get there. So. Uh, yeah, welcome. I'm Paul Hen. I'm with uh, Winfield, Larry's counterpart. I work with uh, genetics and crop protection. This is Mike Vinsville. He's the Monsanto agronomist for the state. Uh, we're going to cover genetics, kind of where, where things start. Uh, so this, this field here, we planted this on the 16th of May. The intention was to plant on the 1st of May, right? Because every good grower wants to have take advantage of the whole crop year, right? Why weren't we here the 1st of May? Wet, cold, Mother Nature. Right? Mother Nature said spring's not starting yet. You stay the heck out of your fields. But if you think about this spring, the 16th of May, we were in here. Uh, should we plant or shouldn't we? Because if you remember the 16th of May, what was the temperature like? Cold. My truck never hit 40 days. <laughs> <laughs> we had coats on, we had sweatshirts on, everybody, no one was sweat. There was absolutely no one sweat. And the, the ground conditions were pretty wet. I mean, it was. Uh, Marginal at best as far as planting. Uh, our cooperator was available that day. We decided to do it. Rain was in the forecast for that night, if you remember. It didn't rain. But Saturday, I don't think it was going to be any drier because it wasn't on the drive. So 
the 16th we ended up we uh, we had planted at 34.6 on the corn. We ended up with 32.5 to 33,000. Fantastic, right? The guys who planted a week earlier, what happened to those guys? Right before Mother's Day. There's the thumbs down, right? The worst time to plant your corn this year in my territory was the 9th, 10th, or the 8th of May in most situations. What happened is you put the corn in the ground, it was kind of cold, it was questionable. We got that Mother's Day rain, two, three, four inches, depending where you were, cold rain. We never got a heat unit the whole next week. I was walking fields and the guys who started at 34,000 ended up with, what was they ended up with? A lot of fields, 24,000, 23,5, a lot of 21. So those fields look pretty good today. But the yield potential is a high end. The yield potential went away with the stand establishment. So getting a stand establishment, and we talked about that earlier, right, with starter applications and the send and those types of things, pretty critical to get high yield is having the plants out there. So that field being prepped right is, is pretty critical. But the genetics is the, is the next piece of that. We work with uh, with multiple brands. We get Cropland, Decal, NK, Micogen here at Premier Co-op. So we work with all four of those brands in these plots. We also work with Pioneer because you expect us to compare to Pioneer. So we compare ourselves to Pioneer. We do uh, a lot of testing across the country. We have 200 answer plots across the country on different soil types. We'll put all those hybrids in there at two different populations, 6,000 plants apart. We'll have a response to population off of that. So 6,000 plants, some hybrids will respond to that in a big way. Other hybrids don't respond hardly at all because of ear flex or because you just don't like to be crowded. So pretty important to know which hybrids like high populations, right? So Joe, if you want to take a field of 45,000, do you want one of those hybrids that doesn't respond to population? Probably not. So you want me to know that, right? So that data is going to give us some idea of which hybrids will respond to what Joe wants to do on his farm. Response to nitrogen is the next thing that we, we try to sort out. So on those trials, we'll We'll have a base rate in one corn trial, the same hybrids, and then an all-you-can-eat kind of rate on another set. So where nitrogen's not the main factor. Some hybrids respond to that higher nitrogen application in a big way. Some don't respond to at all. Which ones like that extra nitrogen, which ones don't necessarily need it. We want to identify which ones of those, figure out how they do. Cross soil types too again. This type of soil right here, almost all your corns there, there's one that's not going to like this environment. Nice deep silt loam soil, beautiful ground, right? You get onto the other side where you got the uh, sandy loam soils, shallow soils, low fertility. Some hybrids will endure that better than others. None of them like it, but some will endure it better. Other ones hate it, will fail. They'll crash and burn on you. So which ones do that, maintain good yields on that tougher environment, and which one should you avoid there? You want to know that? Also getting into the clay ground. That's another environment that some hybrids will excel at. Get up out of the ground, get a good stand. Other hybrids won't get out of the ground, won't have a good stand. And no, no hybrid will yield without a stand. It's just, you start out with the yield limiting factor. And mainly in clay ground where you get some, some challenging enough emergence wise, that's going to be your biggest problem coming out of clay. Once you have a stand, most of them like that environment pretty well because it's a water. So those are some of the things we look at, just the, the base genetics and sorting out which one's like which environment. Response to fungicide, we test that across all those hybrids as we go to more corn on corn. Uh, response to uh, uh, soil type, response to uh, nitrogen, response to corn on corn is another one. Some hybrids will like rotating ground a lot better than other ones can go on a corn on corn and you give up less. So there's a lot of data being generated. A lot of those those ratings, everybody's got a book, right? Every company's got these books. We've got a one to nine rating. One's the best, nine's the worst. So those ratings are in there because we've had examples of where they performed, where they haven't. So if you're getting into uh, you know something that uh, a situation where you want to have something responds high to nitrogen, uh, you want a high score there. So it's just. There's a lot of research going on, a lot of characterization going on that figuring out where those genetics work and where they don't work. Another thing I really want to leave you on is uh, 
one of the key points that you want to take you want to take home is what happened in 2003 in this in the genetics industry on corn specifically. It was a pretty big breakthrough. They, gene, they mapped the genome of the corn plant, and that with marker-assisted breeding. You know, we've been doing these plots since '99. We identified something there. Forty years, we went in the genetics business. I've been at this quite a while. But a bushel and a half per year is the genetic gain. The breeders were going A plus B or times B. We were gaining about a bushel and a half historically per year. So over 20 years, these breeders were gaining 30 bushel. That's a nice deal. But 2006, 2007, 2008, we started recognizing new hybrids doing two and a half, three bushel per year. Oh, something's happened. What do you think it is today, as far as genetic gain per year on genetics and corn? Six. A year ago in the class, the new hybrids compared to the existing line was about 6.2 bushel. Pretty big dump. So everybody here has got a favorite hybrid, right? Raise your hand if you don't have a favorite hybrid. So if you hang on to that favorite hybrid for three years and you had a hybrid that we knew enough about to put on your farm that you could gain that 15 bushel, say it's five bushel. Is that some return on investment there that you could gain potentially by working with somebody that's a trusted seed advisor? And the guys here at the co-op get all the training, they get all the data that they can use that information to get the genetics put on your farm at the right population and the right soil type, with the right crop rotation, with the right traits to get you that return on that investment. So getting to that, that new genetics is a, is a I think a lot of opportunity, even if corn goes to three dollars, three dollars at five bushels is still fifteen. Two and a half acres per bag is forty-five to fifty dollars, even at three dollars. It's pretty significant. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, traits and the future of traits in corn. He's going to talk briefly about uh, what's up and coming in traits in corn. And I'll talk about one that's going to be new and exciting. And I'm going to talk about another trait that's not necessarily new, but uh, you're going to see a higher supply of uh, VT double pros going forward. Anybody familiar with what a double pro is versus a, a smart stack or VT3? Anybody? Double pro is we've got multiple uh, modes of action above ground for corn bore, but we have zero below uh, corn bore and other pests, but we've got zero below ground. Uh, trait protection there from rootworm. So, what would make sense? Where would you plant a double pro, Danny? Corn and corn. Double pro? Uh, the opposite. The opposite. <laughs> uh, double pro, if you're coming out of a rotation, alfalfa, corn, bean, wheat, where you got beans followed by wheat, you're coming back into corn. You know, those are two host crops that are not, uh, uh, they're two crops that are not host crops from rootworms. So, if you look at a rotation, um, Paul's got some plots that I was out ripping uh, some plants out of on a Wednesday where I've got just a straight roundup on a rotated acre with insecticide. The roots looked phenomenal on them. I stepped over 18 rows where I had corn on corn, same trait package with insecticide again, but at a corn on corn, corn rotation versus a uh, corn bean rotation. Even with the insecticide, we had a uh, nodal injury score of about 1.7, 1.8 on the, the majority of those. Um, they weren't real pretty. Um, so what I want to talk about, what is going to be new, what is going to be exciting going forward? Anybody here familiar with smart stacks? Have heard this term before? Only two hands, I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more of them, I think. so, I think a few more know. Um, the next, we, down the road here in a couple years, you're going to hear Monsanto talk about smart stacks Pro. What we're doing is taking the existing uh, trait package, we got multiple modes of action below ground for corn rutland. And we're leaving that the same, but we're going to start introducing something different to a corn plant. Because right now, when we all, all of us in the industry come out with a new event, we're all dealing with crystalline proteins. You may have heard people talk people talk about the CRY 34 slash 35, CRY 3B, AB, 1, 2, 3, C, and all that stuff. What we're going to start doing is looking at the DNA and RNA in a plant. Because what's happening right now is DNA is the, kind of the uh, genetic code for the whole plant. And our RNA comes in and reads that DNA, it's messenger RNA, yeah, it reads the DNA, it starts forming proteins and whatnot that are going to build plants, they're going to build human beings, they're going to they're build every living, breathing, crawling thing that is on this earth. 
Now what we do with RNA is what we call it RNAi. The letter I stands for interference. So what the RNA interference does, it has the ability within a pest like rootworm, we can now, the RNA will read the DNA, it's going to want to turn around and build a protein. Now it's one of two things can happen, it can build a protein, but it will be the wrong protein, or it's going to completely shut down the formation of protein within that insect, or potentially uh, that uh, wheat pest that we're chasing. The other thing that this interference has, the oppor what, not opportunity to do, what it will do, it has the ability to unlock the resistance mechanisms within the pests that we're changing. Uh, we can show this in greenhouses very easily. Um, anybody used to use Pursuit back in the 70s, 80s, or 80s and 90s, excuse me? See a couple head shake, yes. For the first several years, the first few years, we sprayed Pursuit over the top. We might probably pull the Treflon out of the system, and we had gorgeous fields. Suddenly this nightshade that we we're having a problem controlling with is gone. For me back home, cocklebird, ragweed, gone. Uh, foxtail, gone. And all of a sudden, here's this new compound called Pinnacle. Throw that in. We're picking up velvet leaf, lamb scoters. Here's this other little weed called common ragweed, water hemp, that we're not killing. Here's another little compound called Cobra, Flexstar Reflex, Blazer, you name it. The old burners, adding that to it. Today you go out there and spray a field without straight up pursuit. We have more weeds out there that we do not kill than what we physically kill. Now I've got this little RNAi interference. It's going to be specific for pests, specific for plants, or when I say pests, weeds versus insects. You could literally take a jug of something called RNAi, dump it in your tank, and you just have unlocked the resistant uh, cocklebird that we've got in portions of Minnesota for pursuit, and lo and behold, we can kill them. We're doing it in greenhouses right now. We're killing kosher. We, it was one of the first weeds I believe we became resistant to uh, um, the ALS chemistries were, were kosher. And we're killing them. We're not adding any genes. We're just changing how plants, RNA reads the DNA. We're unlocking resistance mechanisms within the DNA so we're able to move forward and kill them. You're going to hear a lot more about that coming forward. We're hoping, my opinion is, about ballpark 18, we'll see Smart Stacks Pro in the market. That's a decent timeline for us. Right now, we don't have any issues with smart stacks in the United States. Is that day coming? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, rootworm is the second most diverse pest God has ever created. We're blowing through multiple families of soil applied insecticides. We've done that already. Uh, and we're starting to see in Iowa, Illinois, where we've got some pockets of true resistance to multiple um, cry crystalline proteins out there, the different cryogens. So we know it's a matter of time. And it's with any pesticide, herbicide, you name it side, there's always a resistant population that's going to build up eventually over time. You look at, uh, we use a buttload of atrazine in the state other than restricted areas, we've got a pretty healthy list of weeds that are resistant to atrazine. So, Mother Nature is always going to be one step ahead of us, we just got to make sure we're always a half step behind her going forward. That's not just Monsanto, that's all of us. We've got to stay on our A game and continue looking forward because change is inevitable. It's coming tomorrow. Yeah, so, so this uh, this trait thing and GMO thing, I think it's continually going to involve change and rapid change. We're going to continue to see things coming and just continue to learn, come to events and figure out what's coming up and some of those things you may want to use in your farm. But this time of year, I, I always say that you might want to have a, a tool in your pocket, a little knife, walk your fields and pull out an ear. So, is that totally pollinated? So when you do that, you go ahead and do the shake test. The ones that fall off, those are pollinated kernels. So this has got a little bit of about an inch to go yet. So we want some more pollen shed in this field. We finished this out at 102 day. I would say the 110 day, 112 day down here, we'd want it to go a little longer than that because that's going to be further behind because it's pollinated later. 95 days, probably all pollinated. So it's pretty much done with that critical phase of, of forming in here. At this point, already though, you can come out here and you can evaluate your pollination. What happens, you walk in the field and the field is moving. It's got bugs all over the field. And your silks are all of a sudden being clipped down to about a half inch of the year. What do you do then? Turn around, walk out of the field and come back next week? Or you call somebody and put some insecticide on and kill those buggers, right? Because you're going to want to keep this pollinating for a little longer. And if the beetles are clipping your silks down to the, to the tip of the kernel, 
pile's not going to get out there, you're not going to finish that grain. You're going to leave a lot of bushels on the table if you don't control the crops. But year in, year out, another good way to do this, and you're not wasting your time by doing it, is once that's pollinated, you're going to get kernels on that cow. You know, if you get late season drought, you might abort some on the tip, and you might get not as deep of kernels, you might get little smaller kernels, but you're going to get kernels on that cow. Corn plant's pretty tough after it's gone through that pollination stage. Culture number around, culture number length, do the math. Multiply that out by how many thousands of years you got on your acre, you're going to get a pretty rough idea how many bushes you're going to get off that field. Divide it by 90,000 if you're pretty confident that they're going to be well developed, deep kernels. Done it by 100,000 if you want to be conservative and be under reporting your bushels. Then decide to do something with it. All of a sudden you're out there and you're looking at 240 bushel coming at you and you got 120 marketed, you're probably going to get more than 120 out of that field. It's pretty hard not to get a kernel once it's pollinated. These, these crops uh, right now on this soil type here, you're going to get a pretty decent yield even if the water shuts off right now. 2012, I would say that uh, you know, this is what we missed in 2012, a lot of, a lot of that pollination nick in 2012. Get by that stage, you're in good shape. But the same thing that's happening in corn, as far as that genetic gain, is also happening in beans. And that's another message for you. That bushel and a half to two bushel per year, at $10 beans, that's $15 to $25 per acre. That's pretty significant yield gain. So if we can identify which varieties are going to go on to those farms and gain that additional yield potential, I think that's pretty critical to continue to look at new things and genetics and adapting to your farm. Bring some new ones on every year and start learning them because you're going to want to get them, learn them faster than you've ever done before and turn them over faster than you've ever done before because it's that potential gain is, is so big that it's something you should not leave on the table. That's one of the key messages I want to leave you with. We're going to finish up in the tent. We're going to have uh, Krista Hamilton talk a little bit about insecticide, or I should say insects, and, and also insecticide probably a little bit. But uh, she's going to talk about trends, things that uh, she's found. She she is responsible for basically monitoring all the insect activity in Wisconsin, and there's a lot of it. So if you think about all the crops we have in Wisconsin, Krista watches apples, cranberries, cabbage, pumpkins, sweet corn, peas, snap beans, all that in addition to what you guys grow. I mean, in addition to corn and soybeans and alfalfa. So she takes care of all the 17 crops in Wisconsin, watches all the bug activity that happens, traps and hormone traps, traps and light traps, sweeps with bug nets, does all that stuff, very active uh, with her group. So we're kind of, we're very lucky to have her come today. She's gonna talk about what she does uh, to uh, analyze and assist people in, in developing pest control programs and, uh, and help us identify new insects that come into the state and deal with them before they become a big problem. So, Krista Hamilton. Yep. Give her a round of applause. Uh, well, thank you, yeah. that was a very nice introduction. Uh, if I talk at this volume, can you all hear me okay? Or should I use a microphone? Does it, does it sound? It sounds okay to me. Oh, We'll try and get you going. Talk as loud as you can for now. Um, as Larry mentioned, I, I coordinate the pest survey program at DATCAP. And this is a nearly 100-year-old program where we, um, we travel almost all of the state each summer. We sample thousands of fields, primarily uh, you know, the, the, the major field crops. Um, and the point of this work is, uh, I guess, there, there's two main points. We want to detect new pest threats. So occasionally, you know, we have our, our standard set of insects, but occasionally new things show up. So um, when we're out in all these fields, we can de detect new things as, as they occur. Um, also, uh, we want to, you know, just keep tabs on general insect conditions during the growing season. So um, we hope that, that the information that we collect and publish can help you, you farmers, um, to anticipate major outbreaks before they occur to take action for that damage. Um, again, we survey all of the major agronomic crops, so we're in corn. Um, we're in corn, uh, soybeans, alfalfa, small grains. Um, is this an okay volume for everyone? Okay. 
So we survey all the major agronomic crops. We also work at specialty crops. So we work with apple growers and, and vegetable growers around the state. Um, and we also, um, so in addition to the surveys that we conduct, besides just sampling fields, we also get information from farmers around the state and uh, fruit and vegetable growers who actually set insect traps for us and send us their counts on a weekly basis. So I guess my point is that we collect a lot of information each year. And um, the reason I have this pest bulletin poster here is because this is what we do with all of the information. It all gets published once a week um, in our pest bulletin. So if, if what I'm talking about today seems interesting to you, you might want to go to our website and subscribe. Um, it's just a, it's a, it comes out each Thursday from April through August during the growing season. Um, and we don't bug you too much, we just send you a uh, once a week email notification when the latest issue is published. So keep the pest bulletin in mind. Um, I also just wanted to mention before I get into the insects that it's, um, I meant for this to just be sort of an informal talk. So if you have any questions, about the bugs I'm talking about, um, just raise your hand, feel free to ask questions as I'm going through these. Um, so we'll start with, uh, I'm gonna start with corn pests, and uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of our soybean, soybean pests and, and alfalfa pests as well. Um, <clears throat> so corn, as you probably know, uh, has different pest problems throughout the year. There's a, a distinct set of early season pests, mid season pests, and late season pests. So um, I'm just gonna have you so we're, we're not going to talk about the early season stuff because that's all that's all in the past. We're on to the mid to late season pests. So I'm going to start with the armyworm. Um, this is the, the true armyworm. And it's um, there's three generations per year in Wisconsin. There's a, a generation in May and June, a generation in July and August, and a third in September. Um, at this point, the first generation is done. We're, we're starting to see a second generation armyworm larvae emerging. Uh, the, the issue with this insect um, is that it's the, the moths lay their eggs in grassy weeds. So if, if you happen to have a field that has late weed control or there's a, you know, a lot of grass, grassy weeds are allowed to develop, um, this is typically where we find armyworm problems because they feed on those grasses. Um, it's not just a corn pest, it's also a wheat pest. In high numbers they can clip the heads of wheat. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's definitely an insect that we scout for every year. Um, and every year we find, issue, we, we find armyworms. They're, they're common. A uh, very common insect, uh, but outbreaks or high, high numbers of, of armyworms only occur sporadically. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to show you this, this next picture. Um, so this is what it looks, this is what a, a major armyworm infestation looks like. They essentially eat all the foliage off of, of corn leaves, leaving only that midrib. And this picture was taken back in 2005, um, in August. This is the last time we saw a, a major problem with um, second generation armyworms. So um, and in that year, we saw problems really all the way from Sauk County up to Polk County, um, this type of thing happening. And what's interesting is, is armyworms get their name because um, once they're done doing this type of thing, they, if they're still um, developing, they actually migrate across roadways and things and move into the next field to do the same type of thing. So um, their damage can be pretty severe. Uh, what I, uh, I guess, as I mentioned, we're, you know, the first generation is over. We're starting on the second generation at this point. Um, and so our surveys have documented um, first generation populations, but the good news is they've been very low. Um, um, so we, between early June and, and uh, yesterday, we surveyed about 300 fields, 300 corn fields. Um, and what we saw are very, very low armyworm populations. We found, um, so if you take a look, it's, it's the green and the yellow circles where we found evidence of armyworm, either caterpillars in the in the corn, uh, in the whorls, or um, uh, you know evidence of feeding. Um, so we found armyworms in about a fifth or 18% of our fields, uh, but at very low levels, less than 10%. So less than 10% with, with larvae or signs of feeding. Um, the threshold for armyworm, what we would consider a high population, is if 25% of plants in your field have, have caterpillars. Um, and as they, if there's a different threshold as the caterpillars get big. They, they feed less, so when they're uh, over an inch, I think it's over an inch or an inch and a half, the threshold bumps up to 75%. So we found it in a lot of our fields, I mean, what I would consider a, you know, roughly 20% of our fields, but at very low levels. So no major problems with first generation armyworms. Um, levels are low. 
So <clears throat> with the second generation that's starting, um, we're not expecting any major problems. Um, I'm basing this on this low first generation. Also, we do monitor moth flights, and we haven't seen any, any major flights at this point. So if infestations do develop, um, I am thinking it's going to be probably in the next two weeks. So um, if it's something you want to be aware of. But um, I guess based on what we've seen so far, we're not expecting anything anything significant from this pest. All right, so um, the next insect I want to talk about is western bean cutworm. And this, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is um, it's, it's in the scheme of things a, a relatively new pest of concern in Wisconsin. It's really only um, moved into the state within about the last decade. And it is, it's primarily a problem in sandier, um, in the sandy, on sandier soil, so in the, the central counties. Although we do find it, you know, we do find it statewide at this point. It's, it's well established here. Um, the way that we monitor, or w the way that we sort of predict um, whether or not this thing is going to be a problem is by monitoring the, the moth flight. And there's just one, one generation per year, one flight. So these moths, uh, well, I guess I, I should say that, um, back up and say that before, um, I, um, up until this point, these things are in the soil. They're in the pupil stage. And about three weeks ago, they started emerging. So this flight has, has basically just begun. Um, we monitor the flight using pheromone traps, which is the, uh, you know, it's a, we put in a little thing that looks like a pencil eraser. It has the scent of the female on it, and it attracts male moths into the trap. And based on these, these pheromone traps, we can tell when the flight starts, when it peaks, and when it, you know, and when it ends. Um, and we, um, we usually set about 100 traps a year. And then, you know, after we, uh, after the season is over, we, we kind of look back at those numbers, and they usually indicate, you know, what, whether the moths were abundant that year or whether we had a low population year. Um, and you can, you know, identify hot spots areas um, or parts of counties where we're likely to see problems with the worms in fields. So, <clears throat> so this year, um, I'm just going to have you switch up on that. Uh, this year we have about 99 traps um, that went up in the last couple of weeks. Again, it's all the, um, the little gray dots are where we haven't caught any moths yet. The, the green dots are where we caught um, 1 to 25 moths, and then those two yellow dots are, or I guess there's just one yellow dot where we caught 20, uh, 26 to 50 moths. So um, basically, the moth flight has been underway for three weeks, and we have seen very few moths so far. Um, our highest count is, um, I believe it was 30 moths at that, that yellow dot, um, which is the Columbia Research Station, in, um, or Arlington Research Station in Columbia County. So. <laughs> Um, the flight has been pretty, uh, pretty minimal so far. Um, we did this week get, we, we also monitor these things in black light traps, and there was a count of 275 moths at Sparta in Monroe County. So that suggests, you know, there's a little bit of activity starting. Um, <clears throat> so the flight's been underway for about three weeks. Um, we're expecting 50% emergence in the next two weeks over, over most of the state. So, um, with this insect, we're, you know, the, all of the action is going to be happening in the next two weeks. And we really won't know until uh, mid-August you know, whether or not we have a big flight and whether or not we're likely to see a lot of, of problems with larvae and corn. Um, and I, I wanted to mention, too, that one of the issues with this insect, why it's potentially more damaging than corn earworm, um, is because you can get multiple larvae per ear, sometimes up to six of these things per ear. So they're a little bit more destructive. They can you know, chew a bit more of the kernel. Uh, of the kernels um, when you get multiple larvae. So anyway, um, you know, uh, here too, it's one of these situations where um, we'll be watching to see what happens in the next couple of weeks. But so far, um, pressure has been very low with this insect as well. <clears throat> okay, so we have another corn caterpillar. This one is the, the corn earworm. Um, <clears throat> and unlike the other two, this one, this one doesn't overwinter in Wisconsin. It, it migrates into the state. Um, usually, it, I mean, we can start getting moths in May and June, but um, there's a primary migration that happens in usually late July, early August, that continues all the way through September. Um, and it's this primary migration that we worry about because when these moths start coming in, they're looking for silking corn to lay their eggs in. So they want, they want those green silks. Um, they lay their eggs on them, and the, the egg hatches, and the 
caterpillar crawls down the, the silk channel into the ear and starts feeding. Um, so whether or not we have problems with this pest really de depends on the size of the migration, if we get a lot of moths, and the timing. I mean, if these things start showing up when you know, the bulk of the, of the crop is in the silking stage, um, then we can potentially see problems. A lot of years they just show up late, um, late August or early September, and, and we're not you know, really concerned about um, uh, silks are brown and you know, we're not concerned about it. So, um, <clears throat> so at this point, um, we have captured in our, we have about 12 um, uh, pheromone traps that are out in place to monitor the flight. And they just started catching uh, the first moths in the last two weeks and numbers have been really low with this insect as well. Um, I think our highest count was about 15 per trap in, um, I wanna say somewhere in Dodge County. So, so far um, they're just starting to, to come in if we get a lot of moths in the next two weeks, um, uh, roughly two weeks, then we could see we could see some larvae, uh, you know, problems with larvae in the ears because, um, you know, at this point, I think an average of, of 20 percent or 22 percent of the state's corn is silking right now, and you know, down here, obviously, a lot a larger percentage, more like 40 percent. So these are the fields that are susceptible to this thing as it's flying in. They're going to look for these fields, lay their eggs. Um, so. We'll just see what happens in the next weeks. If, if, if we don't see a lot of moths in the next two weeks, it's probably not a concern. Um, so we'll just have to, have to watch and see what happens. Um, <clears throat> and um, so here's the corn rootworm beetle. And this is probably the insect that most of you are interested in. And I, I don't have a lot to say about it, unfortunately, um, because we, uh, most of the work that we do at the department is um, monitoring the adult population. And we, we time that, you know, we're counting, we go out and count, count um, beetles in about 200 fields across the state. But we don't do that until about mid-August because this is when we expect the, the, popu the beetle populations to reach peak level. Um, I think we had about 50% hatch, egg hatch at Madison around July 1st. So, um, and we saw our first beetles on July 9th. So it's really, they've only really been active for about two weeks. So they're, they're just starting to, to emerge um, and, you know, become more numerous. So we haven't seen a lot of action at this point. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really have any uh, survey numbers, um, but we've heard a lot about corn rootworm beetle today. And what I would say is that when we start seeing these beetles, um, you know, it's kind of a rem reminder to, um, uh, that it's probably time to do some root digs, uh, checking, you know, digging up these roots, checking them for, for pruning. Um, you can always do the, you know, the dunking them in water method to see if any larvae float up. And if you're getting these things, um, you know, if you're seeing a lot of root uh, feeding or pressure, then it's it's certainly time to, you know, think about changing your management plan or or trait decision for 2015. Um, <clears throat> also, um, you know, the, it's also a reminder that, that we want to still look for the beetle populations that are going to be emerging in August. So. Um, I think at one of the sites we, you know, the, we talked about how the beetles are just sort of coming onto the plants. Um, they can, uh, they can clip the silks back. You know, you really want to watch to make sure that they're not impairing po pollination. But um, seeing a couple beetles in a field shouldn't worry you. They're there all. I mean, these things are really numerous. We see them all the time, and um, it, it, it's what you know. They, they can move from one field to another. They prefer late, late silking fields. Um, so don't be alarmed if you see a few. What we're talking about, the, the, the type of level that can impair pollination, is five beetles per plant. So you really have to have a lot of them to, you know, before you get, get worried about it. Um, but again, they're starting to emerge, so if, if this is an insect of concern for you, you probably want to um, either go out and check your field yourself or have somebody check it for you and um, just make sure you're not seeing those, those really high levels of beetles, five, five or more per plant. Um, and I guess, you know, a, a lot of beetles in a field does indicate that you know that they're laying a lot of eggs. So if you're going to replant corn to that field, um, you want to make sure you know if you're seeing. Actually, the threshold um, the threshold for silk clipping is five per plant. The threshold for egg laying and potential root damage is just one per plant. So if you see an average of one beetle per plant anytime between August and September, that suggests a lot of eggs are being laid, and that you want to have those. You know, if you're going to plant corn again, you want to have those roots protected. Um, and we do do an annual survey. Um, those results will be available sometime in August, um, but, but you know we probably won't start the survey until the second week of August. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, uh, and then the last corn pest I want to mention is Japanese beetle. Uh, if this is an insect that you haven't 
given much thought to, uh, you probably should because it's, it's just become more and more widespread in the last couple of years. Um, and really, it, it occurs almost statewide at this point. It used to be really limited to the southeastern part of the state, um, south central area. And now we're finding it all the way up in the, you know, Barron County and Oconto counties. Uh, <clears throat> and the concern um, is, is what you see in this picture. Uh, these things fly into fields when they're silking and, uh, and put those silks back. And when you get one beetle, it, um, it, it sends out a, a aggregation pheromone. So one beetle sends out a message to all the other beetles, hey, this field's got, got silks for us to eat. So, uh, so you get a lot of them. And this, um, what you see here is, I don't know, seven or so beetles. What we're worried about are populations of three beetles per ear. So if you get three of them per ear on, and this is field-wide, if you, that's the threshold population that means you wanna you know, consider some form of control. So with all of these insects, you know, I, seeing a few of them shouldn't, it shouldn't worry you. It's when you get these really high populations, three or more per year, that, that you want to be concerned that they're you know, possibly um, affecting kernel you know, um, fertilization. Um, and it's also a soybean pest. So it's not just in corn, but these things also chew on soybean leaves. And um, usually by itself, it, it's not you know, enough to cause um, severe defoliation, but when you're combining it with feeding by caterpillars, um, bee leaf beetle, grasshoppers, all of these things together can sometimes drive up that defoliation level above threshold. Um, so this is, you know, you want to be watching um, at this time of year for defoliation, and the threshold in, in soybeans is 20% feeding. So if you see um, feeding on 20% of the plants and it's, it's fairly severe, that's um, what, you know, would, would indicate you would need some form of um, control against defoliators like Japanese beetle. <clears throat> All right, so what, what the insects that you see on the leaf here are soybean aphids. Um, <clears throat> this is probably the number one, well, at least recent years, it's been our number one um, soybean insect pest. Uh, it first showed up in, in the U.S. Um, and in Wisconsin back in 2000, so this is a, a relatively new pest as well. Um, <clears throat> the story with soybean aphid is that populations that we've seen this year have been very low. Um, we've surveyed, uh, you can see on the map, I think about 350 fields, and so far um, our highest count, and this is, uh, this is starting in you know, early June through just a couple days ago, um, so in our 300 and some fields, we found only two, well, our highest count was only 17 aphids per plant. Um, what's considered a, a higher economic threshold is 250. So we're talking 17 versus 250. It's really, really low. Um, the, most of our fields, all those green dots, those are where we found less than 10 aphids per plant. Um, the, the two yellow circles are where we found 11 to 20. So what this suggests is that aphid pressure has been very, very low so far this year. Um, now at this point, uh, we're getting into sort of the, the period when aphid populations usually build the most most rapidly. They they seem that these populations usually seem to increase um, exponentially as plants reach the R3 or R4 stages. You know the um, uh, basically you know er, um, beginning pod to, to full pod. So. While we haven't seen a lot of pressure, um, I've heard a few reports of, of high populations. We haven't haven't seen anything like that. Um, we are getting into this this window when you really want to um, sort of intensify scouting or have somebody check your beans to make sure these things aren't approaching threshold. Um, and if, if um, it's determined that you do need to treat, you really need to do that before R5, you know, before full pod um, or C C fill, um, just to make sure. That, that it's it's having an effect. Uh, beyond R5, it really doesn't have any sort of impact on, it might look better to kill off all the aphids, but it really doesn't have any sort of impact on yield. So um, here again, I keep saying the next two weeks, but it, it really is a critical time. Um, probably in the next two weeks is when, when these decisions need to be made. And if you don't have um, economic populations by mid-August, you're probably not gonna see them. So um, now's the time to, to be scouting for aphids. Okay, um, so the last insect that I want to talk about is potato leafhopper, um, and this is the you know the primary insect pest in uh, alfalfa, and it it's another one of these migratory pests where you know our our problems I, I like to think our problems come from the southern U.S. 
So um, these things fly up on storm fronts starting in mid-May, generally. Uh, usually not an issue in the first crop, but um, they can build it in, if we get a lot of, of these, um, if, if there's a lot of storms from the south that blow these things in, we can see high populations in the second crop. It's usually the third crop, though, uh, where we have problems. So far, um, what this map shows is that so far, leaf hopper pressure has also been very, very low. Um, we've looked at um, almost 500 alfalfa fields since uh, mid-May, since these things first started arriving. And we have not found a single field that had economic populations. And so what I'm talking about is if you, you saw how Jeremy did the sweet, um, the sweet net example. So if you go out, uh, I guess incidentally too, this is one of the easiest things to scout for if you have a net. It takes just a couple of minutes. You go out in your field, you take, you know, um, uh, 50 sweeps, you can take just five sets of 10. And what we're talking about a high, as far as a high population is if you take, um, if you take 10 sweeps, and you find 20, 20 of these things. So we're talking two per sweep is the threshold. In our surveys, um, and, and taking 50 sweeps, you want to check up a few areas of the field, but it takes 10, 10 or 15 minutes. It's really easy to do, um, and, and you can know your leaf hopper level. In our surveys, we have, uh, I think the highest count we found was 1.7 per sweep. Uh, that's still below that threshold, that two per plant, or two per sweep threshold. Um, and I should mention too that the threshold changes with alfalfa height. So the shorter it is, the fewer leaf hoppers it can tolerate. But when it gets above 12 inches, the threshold is two per plant, or two per sweep. Um, between eight, I think eight and 11 inches, it's it's um, one per sweep. But either way, we haven't seen any any of these high populations at all this year. Um, now though, as we're going into the third crop, um, in the past two weeks, we've noticed that we're seeing a lot more nymphs, which are the, the immature stage, the, the leaf hopper babies, I guess. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of those, and when you get a lot of those in your alfalfa, it suggests that they're, they're reproducing. Um, and they seem to like the hot, dry weather that, you know, that we, I guess we had earlier this week, not today, but, um, so if we see, you know, if, if conditions stay drier, if we see higher temperatures, this, the, those types of things favor leaf hoppers, and they could build up in the third crop, um, and into the fourth crops as well. But, but um, here again, this, this insect too, we haven't seen a lot of leaf hopper pressure so far this year. So um, I guess that concludes what I wanted to talk about with the major crop pest.